So uh, I'm one of five girls. We all played really high level tennis. Uh, my sister Shika and I, we, um, we played um, professionally. Um, I started at the age of nine uh, in, a, in a tennis academy in Florida. I moved from my home in New Jersey to start training in an academy. Uh, we kind of you know, saw that there was, my parents really saw that there was interest and talent. And my father really was the main driving force behind choosing tennis and you know trying to make uh, us elite athletes and um it was a really you know big investment like all of you know it was six days a week you know since the age of nine uh homeschooling schooling on the side tutoring at night no social life uh at the age of 15 i actually applied and got into uh princeton to school to college uh, that was really important for my parents for me to you know, have a kind of a backup plan. They were already thinking about that. I think just probably culturally, you know, being Asian American, education is super important. So I went my freshman year of college at 16. Uh, I played a year of varsity tennis. Uh, I got rookie of the year. Uh, it was rough being really young uh, at a really highly academic, you know, um, you know, really competitive school. Uh, and a lot of me was saying, okay, I just have to get through this year and then I'm going to go on the tour. That's where I belong. My sister had done the same thing a year, uh, two years ahead of me. So I had already been playing professional tournaments by that, you know, by that age. So it was just sort of that stepping stone for me. Um, and by the time I left freshman year, I was on the tour. I had already had a ranking. And I played on the tour for five years. Uh, I reached top um, top uh, 200 in singles and uh, top 110 in doubles. I don't even remember. I have to remember this stuff. Um, and I uh, played in the U.S. Open, you know, Wimbledon, um, Australian Open. We were traveling 30 to 40 weeks out of the year. Uh, it was a grind, you know, and. Uh, I think to be a, an elite athlete in any sport requires tremendous sacrifice in every aspect of your being, your family. It requires so much give. And, um, you know, my family, my parents, we were all willing to do that. And at a certain point, you know, as a young woman kind of realizing what was happening, I kind of recognized that this really wasn't my goal. It wasn't a dream that I had personally. It was something that I was sort of navigated into, pushed into, and it was told to me, you know, that this is how I will get validated by society. Um, and this is what I'm supposed to be doing. So things started really unraveling for me when uh at one point uh a coach that i had was like you know kind of like my last coach um he was really detrimental to kind of um my relationship to tennis and to myself uh very toxic in like the most quintessential ways weighing me six times a day like really just focused on my weight it wasn't really an issue but it became one because it was his way of controlling me, of finding ways inside my really, really grounded brain. And it, and it worked. He really broke me down on top of the pressure that I already put on myself and my parental pressure. I think all three of those things were kind of, you know, the last straw. And I ended up suffering from um, an eating disorder while I was on the tour, while I reached some of my best results, I was suicidal. I remember winning, uh, beating a, a top 50 player, a top 50 ranked player for the first time, 6-0, 60, I mean, zero, like I didn't give her a game. And I came back to my hotel room and I wanted to jump out the window. You know, I mean, I was really rock bottom. I could tell no one. And that really stayed with me. The fact that I couldn't tell anyone, I was screaming for help, that I was bulimic, I was throwing up blood, you know, I was getting dizzy, I was binging and purging three to six times a day. 
And it was no longer even about my body image or weight or any of that. It was literally my way of coping, of controlling my emotions and my anger and my numbness. Um, and it worked because vomiting is a very violent action and, you know, it kind of, kind of calmed me and I would fall asleep, but it was not sustainable, obviously. And it got to a point where, you know, I couldn't even see straight in one of my matches and my father was there and he said, well, you know, what's going on? And there was one person on the tour that I kind of told and she immediately you know, knew what to do. She got me into an, enti in a, into an eating disorder center back at home. But, you know, that was actually where the work started, where it became even more of a problem because I think being South Asian, you know, being in a athlete family, this, this eating disorder was seen as a huge weakness. It was a mental weakness that, you know, was not welcomed. It was really, really shunned. And um, that made everything just that much worse because there was no acceptance of the issue. You know, it was all seen as an excuse, as weakness. I couldn't process what was right, what to believe, what was rational, what wasn't. But I had this this problem. And, um, you know, I, I, my, my mom kind of stepped in and she said, okay, we need to do something. And once kind of the binging and purging stopped, which stopped pretty fast, there was still so much bulimic, you know, um, kind of disease still in me that I had to work through. But I immediately said, oh, I have to get back to tennis because that's who I am. That's all I know. And that's what is expected of me. And I'm, you know, getting threatened almost every day to get back on the court and play. And every time I would step back on the court, the bulimia I would start back up. It would just keep bubbling back up. And I couldn't understand what was wrong with me. Why was I, and it, you know, I was cutting, I was suicidal again. And I, I said, you know, I'm just a waste of a person. I mean, I was so deeply depressed. And then I finally, you know, was, and, and I'm, by the way, I was playing the worst tennis of my life, right? Like, so that also didn't help. You know, I, I mean, I was losing to people who were ranked thousands of spots below me. Like I just, I wasn't in the game anymore. And at 21, 22, I, I had to make the hardest decision of my life, which was I have to quit this sport. I have to either kill myself playing the sport or I have to quit this and choose to be happy. And just like battling that decision, I was in Japan for weeks. You know, I, I couldn't sleep. I mean, it, I was by myself. I mean, I was completely isolated. I was in a tiny hotel room in the middle of like small towns in Japan playing satellite tournaments. And then I just said, okay, I have to do this. And I mean, I was shaking. I wrote my parents an email and I got all the backlash. You know, I mean, I had a huge fallout with my, my dad, all of that, but I had a backup. My backup was Princeton University. You know, I had, I knew I could go to something and education kind of was that saving grace. But when I wrote back to my Dean, he said, sorry, you can't come this year. It was August. I was wanting to plan, you know, to go right away in September. He said, you have to wait a year because you're too late. So that was another blow to me. So what am I going to do for a year? Do I have to support myself? Do I have to find a job? You know, can I live with my parents? It was really rock bottom. And I struggled a lot that year. I learned so much. I enrolled in a community college just to kind of take some classes again. I worked at a retail store. Um, my parents hated that I was working at a retail, retail store, but I just, I said, I have to do what normal like 22 year olds do. Like what, you know, what did I miss? Who am I? All these questions. I remember when I was first day in the retail store, I saw like the TV across the food court. There was a professional soccer match there and I was folding clothes and I just had a meltdown. You know, I just said, what am I doing here? I'm supposed to be there. I'm supposed to be there on TV where I used to be. Uh, and it, that voice, that kind of, I'm not supposed to be here. Who am I? What am I doing? That stayed for a long time, Miriam, a really long time. And I couldn't find answers. 
and I was really isolated. And then I threw myself into a highly academic competitive environment, like you know, Ivy League school, and I was drowning there. I did, hadn't done math in six, seven years, you know, and I was taking stats classes with these literally like Jeopardy champions and math mathletes and, you know, and I, again, kind of, you know, you, you get addicted to that stress and that feeling of inadequacy kind of followed me into, you know, up until the, my last year of college. And I was deeply depressed, high functioning depression because come on, I'm a former professional athlete, you know, I can do this. But I started seeking help. I started going to therapy. And in therapy, I wasn't really making a lot of progress. I was hitting a lot of blocks. Mainly, I felt, you know, there was a lot of work to do and unpack. But the therapists I was working with, A, didn't understand the culture of what it is to be an elite athlete. And that was that is so clear to me now in hindsight, but it wasn't at the time. So in many, many instances, it actually hurt me more than it helped me to sometimes go to therapy and be also the culture of being an Indian girl, you know, Indian American girl and the kinds of, of things I've been told in my culture. So, you know, it took me a really long time to kind of find what was true what was told to me from a young age that I thought was true, that is no, is not actually logical or rational. And what do I want to believe, you know? And that took a long time. I'm 35 now. I started therapy at 22, 23. You know, it took at least six years of consistent work. And not a lot of that work was done with a therapist. It was self a lot of self-work, a lot of journaling and writing and trying to find answers. I so deeply wanted to free myself of what was kind of this, this deafening noise and this depression that had gotten hold of me. And the, the one thing I had was willpower. We all as athletes have it, willpower. And when we channel it and use it towards what we want to achieve, we can do amazing things. And I remembered that about me. I said, I can, I have that confidence that I can do anything I want to do. And that's what athletics gave me. You know, if I want to figure out a way to be content and be happy, I'm going to figure it out. You know, if I want to be a pro surfer tomorrow, I'm going to figure it out and, and do it. And I think that kind of confidence is what propelled me and pulled me you know, out of it. But along the journey, it became so clear to me time and time again that, hey, man, like nobody's understanding what I'm saying, that I'm saying that I was really good at something from a young age. I don't know how it feels to be uncomfortable. I don't know where I'm supposed to be. I'm, I feel really special. Perhaps I'm suffering some, from some covert narcissism, which we can talk about later, you know, uh, can we unpack this? Uh, that just, it wasn't there, you know, it was, you're young, you know, you should go out on dates, you should, you know, it was sort of like, this is not working. So that led me to, uh, to find social work and to become a clinician with the ultimate goal is to work with athletes, both with people who are currently playing and who want uh, help with their mental health, their well-being, and their performance. I think those three things are so tied together uh, firsthand and also just seeing in the work I'm doing. And then second, on the transition. As you know, Miriam, more and more we're seeing data and stats and information about planning for your future after such a short career is so beneficial to your you know, current career as an athlete and also just to your well-being, you're doing yourself, your future self a favor. And um, I'm very passionate about that. I studied this in my undergrad and then I took that undergraduate thesis and have continued to, it, continued to look at athlete transitions, both at the collegiate level and at the professional level. Wow, that's a pretty packed experience. So early on in your life, I mean, like I, Feel like that you have been on this hamster wheel very early on um, trying to achieve everything um, or 
being asked to achieve everything, whether it's education or your sport. And um, first of all, the achievements were amazing. But second of all, it seems that perhaps you had, I mean, I see it with quite a few athletes. There is a maturity of being organized, organized, being able to do a lot of things, being a competitive, being resilient, but there is a lot of immature um, level from a social perspective and emotional perspective. Uh, and so I find that fascinating that um, the, the two go in parallel. And sometimes when it's so misaligned, it really breaks. Um, what what a what a story and you talk a fair bit about being isolated yet you had four sisters that played tennis were you ever able to to share with them or did they recognize what was happening um how was the situation yeah. with them that that's a good point i think we grew up in such a competitive environment the you know the five of us when we did share you know it was much later and we always have each other's back when it comes to an emergency, right? You're in a crisis, your sister's gonna come and save you. But the day to day, you know, the bit by bit where you're saying, I'm feeling this, you know, I didn't feel like I could open up to that. And I didn't feel like it would be received because we were all in the same soup, you know, no one had perspective. No one could step back and say, hey, this is what's going on. And I think that isolation you know, I don't think that it was self-imposed because I, I sure did reach out. I sure did make efforts to connect with people, but I just don't think there was a culture. And I'm talking about just 10, five, 10 years ago of sharing these, these issues. I mean, I remember going to a physical library and then like Google and trying to search, did anyone else I know have an eating disorder? Did any other professional have this issue? How did they overcome it what was you know what was their life story and i mean i really could barely find anything were you aware of what was going on with you or were you trying to first identify what was going on so i didn't ever think that i had an eating disorder i said i know what i'm doing i'm doing this i'm binging binging purging because my coach told me i can't eat dinner and i'm starving from seven hours of training and he's gonna weigh me tonight so I'm going to eat and then I'm going to throw up and I'm going to step on the scale and I'm going to make the whatever imaginary weight was in his fucked up head, part of my French, and then I'm going to go to sleep. And uh, that kind of became a cycle. And I thought I was always in control until I wasn't, until it, you know, I started liking the feeling of vomiting because the anger and all the, you know, things I couldn't say uh, and express were coming out. So I didn't think I had a problem. And when I went to the eating disorder center, I said, I'm not like these girls. You know, I don't, I don't have body image issues. I'm not crying because some boyfriend dumped me because I was 10 pounds overweight. You know, that's not my issue. You know, I'm trying to be somebody, you know, that, that was kind of what I was talking about. And, you know, one of the counselors said, well, you just ate, you know, how do you feel? And I was like, what a stupid question is this? You know, like, I have time for this. Like, what, what do you mean, how do I feel? And it was that day that I realized, wow, I actually have no idea how I feel. I am completely out of touch with my emotions. I couldn't name for you if I was happy or sad or confused or full or empty. I couldn't. And uh, that's when it kind of started clicking for me to say what you just mentioned, that kind of maturity in the you know operational kind of physical piece and the complete lack of emotional intelligence and uh, you know relationship to the self how, how did you come to that that decision of actually leaving tennis i mean if if you look at your life at that point everything about your life had been built towards that goal and um, everything has been organized, whether it's your, your school, your family life, your sisters, your parents, everything was shaped around tennis. Yes. Now you had achieved it, you were on the tour. How did you come to terms with the decision of living? It's a really difficult thing to do. Do you remember the thought process or the, the were you able to identify your emotions at that point? And 
And how did you come to terms with the decision? I wouldn't say at a moment. It was probably about a week. I was traveling in Japan uh, tournaments and I was playing shitty, horrible, and I, my mind was somewhere else and I was journaling every day and I was so unhappy. I just remember feeling just so, like I just deeply depressed. Um, I was even in Australia before that and Martina Hingis, if you're not a tennis player, but I mean, she's like one of the biggest stars in tennis ever, came up to me and said, hey, do you want to practice? And I said, no. No, I don't want to practice. And that was like, you know, you know, one of your idols is asking you if you want to share a court with them and you're saying, no, I think that's a pretty telling sign that you might not want to be here. You know, that your whole physical mind and body, I couldn't even, I didn't even think before I answered the question. And then I thought, I said, wow, I just turned down Martina Hingis. I don't care. You know, and I just left. And that's kind of, you know, a couple of those things happened in a row. But there was so much fear, Miriam. There was fear of, you know, letting down my parents and their expectations. My sibling, my sister, letting her down, leaving her on the tour. Um, she was your not, partner at the time, right? She was yes. your partner in double? Yeah. yeah, she was my doubles partner, exactly. And my, you know, she was my best friend. And, you know, leaving her, you know, she would be upset. There was so much of everybody else. And then I said, well... I honestly think that it's going to kill me. Like, I think I'm physically going to take my life. It's going to come down to that. And even when I, la when I stopped tennis and I came back, I was still really depressed. It's not like, oh, tennis, was now everything's gone because, you know, now I'm happy because I'm not playing tennis. It was still there with me. So that also made me question my decision in that year of like, oh, was it the tennis? Was it me? Should I go back? There was so much fluctuation and doubt. And, you know, people don't tell you that that's going to continue to be, should I go back on the tour? You know, that'll happen for a long time, at least six years, you know, or if you're older, maybe when your, you know, body tells you, hey, I don't think I can do this. But I was really young and I was sort of in my, you know, prime of, of competing. So there was one, mo one moment, like maybe a week, but I think it had come over a, a kind of three month period. Uh, and it was, you know, if I had gone back, I think it was so long overdue. Like, why did it take me so long, you know? Yeah, you had reached your, your tipping point and it was building up so, so much that this was it. That's it, um, exactly. You know that voice though, that, that um, that is there after you retire and is like, what if, what if I came back for a little bit? What if I tried again? I think when you're in that period where you have retired, but you cannot quite see yet where you're going to be, where, what new interest, what new pursuit you're going towards. Yeah. That period before you don't know where you're going, I think is where that voice is pretty strong, where you, you're still thinking, there might be a chance for me to go back because I'm so uncomfortable with the position I'm in right now. It's so unknown, right? It's so uncertain. I've left something that I knew that I'm very familiar with and I'm really good at and I'm going, I don't know where. That, that middle ground is really when the voice is pretty strong. You're so right. And you know, that plus, when you have or when you're starting to achieve certain levels of notoriety and fame and people in the world know you as something you want to crawl right back to that that social status that it gave you the you know answering the question what do you do where are you from you know it's it's daunting it's scary and uh you know your ego is hurt your everything is hurt and bruised but at the same time there's also something within you that's telling you, no, you know, if I wanted to keep doing this, I would have kept doing this. There's a reason why I'm not doing this, you know, and, and it's about which voice you're going to listen to in that moment and uh, which one is going to get, which wolf really is going to get stronger. And I think for, you know, for us, like, you know, it's like a, a muscle analogy. Which muscle are you going to work out more? The one that tells you to crawl back to what you know, or the one that tells you, like, 
venture into the unknown because this is what your heart is telling you. And I think we as athletes don't really have a lot of practice listening to ourselves because we're constantly told to push ourselves past whatever our brain or our mind or our body is telling us. So there's that like ignoring and then at 23 years old, it's uh, maybe we should start listening to what Neha has to say because she might have some answers and she might be really intelligent about who we are. And um, it's uncomfortable, it's scary. It is actually so scary that I remember having panic attacks, like sitting in a classroom, sitting in my dorm room in these four walls and thinking, I haven't traveled on a plane in a week, in two weeks, this is uncomfortable. I need to get out and go somewhere. I, I was going to ask you about this. I mean, tennis is a very specific word and sport where you're on the go constantly. The season okay. is year round. You're on a plane every other week, uh, every week. You're going to a different destination, a different hotel, a different time zone, and you go, go, go all the time. And that then you decided to stop and you have to enter this life where you're not a nomad. Um, I would imagine this was a huge, away from the, the emotional side and the, the, the retirement, just in itself, that, that change of lifestyle is very impactful. The body remembers so much. The body wants to keep moving and going and doing things. And suddenly you're sitting still for four or five, six hours in a classroom and you're coming home to the same bed every night. And it's, the body is, you know, as much as the mind is resisting, even the body's resisting and saying, let's go. What are we doing here? This is, this is not right. This seems off. Something's off. And that feeling of something not feeling off, that unsettling feeling, it stayed for a long time. And, you know, you could assuage it with working out intensely, you know, going to New York City for the weekend or, you know, doing kind of exciting things and trying things. But it was still there. Like, this doesn't feel like home. This doesn't feel like home. Uh, the tennis court feels like home, even though that's where there's so much pain and this very, um, you know, push pull kind of relationship. And, you know, being able to kind of have what they call in DBT uh, distress tolerance, being able to say, yes, I'm feeling uncomfortable yet I am still, and I'm still here, you know, uh, being able to give witness to that and just to witness it without, you know, giving that, having a little bit of perspective. I didn't have that. I didn't have someone telling me, hey, this is what you're going to feel. And when you feel this way, you know, do these things. Uh, and I think that's what's so great about programs like what you're building, because we've been through it. We can tell people what to expect. And I think just having knowledge is so powerful. We get addicted to the training, this feeling in your body that you worked really hard, that you pushed yourself further than the limit at every practice. You know, this is really addictive. And through all of the things that were happening to you, dealing with an eating disorder, the emotional um, instability, were you also missing that? Were you missing that physical pain of a, a good workout? Absolutely. And I, actually, I would take it a step further and say it was really like, I haven't earned my dinner. I'm not exhausted. You know, all these people are lazy. We're just sitting around. We haven't, I mean, I would feel literally dirty if I hadn't completely sweat, you know, through to my hair in a day. And that changed, that took about a year to adjust to, uh, but I, but absolutely, you know, it was the, the physical need to just expel and run and train and lift and, you know, go to the gym. So I was still pretty fit post tennis. It's not like I, I didn't reject fitness. Some people reject fitness and that's fine. It was opposite for me. I said, I need to earn uh, my dinner. I need to feel like I have completely exhausted myself and i also miriam i had a lot of energy i had a lot of nervous energy a lot of nervous energy and i had a lot of physical energy because i was really fit 
So I had to find outlets for that, that, you know, were, were safe and that were like, would make me feel good. So I, yeah, definitely. That was something I experienced. I was laughing at that comment because I can relate to that. I had a lot of energy and, and nervous <laughs> energy, but there was also this, um, get into a brain fog when you exercise less. Um, I think when you're really fit and at your top of your fitness, there's some sort of purity from a, a brain perspective that's attached to it, I feel. Um, some sort of clarity and in, in sometimes when you don't have the physical activity, you sort of feel a little bit in, in, in the fog. Um, so it, it, it's really interesting to hear still that, that, that feeling of wanting to earn your dinner. Um, and maybe there's some lingering thing from the eating disorder as well that was still there and you know, it took some time. Yeah. Definitely, okay. definitely. Do you feel that you, I mean, we, we know that transitioning is a journey. Um, and it's definitely a process that takes a long time. Do you feel that you've now like sort of completed that process or you're still on your journey? Um, how do you look at that? Can you play tennis? Do you play tennis? Yes, I really do think I have transitioned out of tennis. Uh, and I would say that probably happened to me in the last three years, uh, like fully. And the way I can say that is because I would give, I can give myself little tests and see what does my brain feel? What are the immediate thoughts that go in my head? How good am I at you know, uh, using my skills and, 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 my, and my thoughts uh, to kind of recalibrate myself when I do have issues? And so I can say that for sure, uh, I have transitioned. I recently was a board member of the United States Tennis Association where we had to be at the US Open for two weeks. And I had to sit in a beautiful box seats for two weeks, you know, and, and kind of be an ambassador to tennis. And I said, oh my gosh, am I going to be able to do this? I was in the middle of grad, grad school. I was pregnant. I had a young child and I had a freak out for, for a minute. I said, oh my gosh, I'm going back to my old stomping grounds. So I actually took my husband before all that, uh, you know, and I said, okay, this is, you know, this is where it all happened. This is where it all went down. And, you know, this is who I was, like, you know, just kind of showing him the physical space. And when I walked in, I was like, oh, this is it. This is what I, this is what I made in my head. You know, it, there was this sort of very different approach to it all. And also, uh, you know, having someone to kind of share it with and, and show, uh, kind of showed me that, yeah, I actually am really quite far past this, you know, I'm not still attached to this in, in any way. So I think, you know, doing those kinds of exercises slowly really kind of has affirmed for me that, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm over this. This is a pretty big trigger. Um, and if you're able to pass the, those markers, right, it really shows that, that you're okay with it. You want to know something funny? I lived in New York City post graduating from college, right? And I would see the US Open cars. They have these beautiful cars that they transport the players in every year. And I was working in some marketing job, you know, so I would go back to my apartment and I would see these, these cars. And, you know, the first year that I saw them and I mean, it was just crying and crying and I'm supposed to be in that car. What am I doing here? Working a nine to five. And, you know, I would see the, ten the players on the subway and just like put my head down and, you know, just become depressed. And then every year it just got easier and better. And, you know, as I continued to do my work, and to do my self work and you know to make the steps i realized like i had made the decision i wanted to and i was really happy you know i was actually content and i was going i was growing i had personal growth but it's hard and i don't i i think that we should all know that you know that this is going to be hard and it's not like tomorrow i'm fine it's going to take at least 6 years i think that's really reassuring when you've been dealing with such traumatic and difficult times and a lot of people want to run away from it, you know, and, and just not have anything to do with, with the game, not play it, not do anything. And, you know, for me, I think, uh, A, it was a really good uh, job to coach tennis while I was, a, while, while I was back in, in college. So that was very attractive to me. And B, I kind of saw playing again a way to take back my power and a way to take back 
you know, the joy of a game I had as a child that was sort of taken away from me in a way. And so I actually started coaching young, young children and youth. And I thought, well, maybe this is a way for me to say like, if I wanted, you know, this is how I might've wanted to have been coached, or this is my approach I might've wanted to have. Plus I'm making, you know, money on the side. Uh, and it also, it also fed a very important part, I think, when you are transitioning of me, which was to return back every day to something that I excel in so that I could have that kind of fulfillment and say, hey, I'm venturing into new uncomfortable spaces, but I can return home to base whenever I need to kind of fill my ego up or fill, fill myself up to feel like, okay, I'm socially validated somewhere where I'm really good and people know me for that. And now I can venture out again. So it was a really nice way for me to kind of keep going to the nest and coming back and going to the nest and coming back. And now what I look at tennis for is more like, this is my, my art. Like this is my skill and it's something I like to do once in a while. Like I like you know, like a painter might want to paint, you know, it's sort of just like, okay, it's my skill. It gives me a workout. It's social. And um, I look really good when I do it. You know, <laughs> that's the bottom line. <laughs> it's a really good image because it's this idea that you were an athlete and this will continue to go with you taking it with you. It's not disappearing. You're taking right. it with you and you adding layer to the narrative or the identity you adding you know i was this and i'm gonna take it and now i'm also this 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 and this um and i think just you, you said it perfectly added, yeah it's, it's adding it's not saying i have to re i have to undo and redo it's just adding that next layer and you know i think that just makes makes your life experiences and the next things you do just that much more colorful and that much easier. I'm sure you've experienced it, right, Miriam? Waking up yeah. at not, you know, 8 a.m. for a 9 a.m. is so easy. Like <laughs> One thing that's really interesting that um, I've heard from a lot of athletes is through that process of, of transition, they've learned so much about themselves, peeling off the layer to, figuring, to figure out exactly who they were and what they want to do and discovering this whole range of emotions that they can now uh, identify and articulate and use to their benefit um, and a lot of former athletes de describe it as just being a little bit more whole I, I feel um, and, and for me that's a really hopeful message for someone who retires because it is a, a something they will dread it's, it is scary it brings a lot of challenges and changes but the other side is you're gonna learn a lot more about yourself than you could you could have ever imagined. Even when you push through the limit of your body and mind as an athlete, perhaps you didn't learn as much as what you will do through your transition. That was so beautifully said. You're so you're so right. You know, when I when I was starting the transition, I thought, well, you know, I I've done the hardest thing. You know, I've done the hardest things. I've trained the hardest i've pushed my body the hardest my mind the hardest but actually this was the hardest thing because uh it really you know hit all of my weaknesses and opened them my wounds up to broad daylight day in and day out and i i'm so grateful that i had to go through that painful experience at such a young age some people will never have to kind of look at themselves so rawly and so uh, openly as we might have had to. Uh, and to have done that, you know, before turning the age of 30, I think is like a, like just for a spiritual development is such a blessing. But I also, um, you know, have to remember that I was really young. I was, in my case, I was a young adult. So parts of who I was emotionally, personality-wise, were not even fully developed or explored. And I think that, uh, you know, th there is something to be said about that journey as well on top of the transition. So I would agree with you, you know, you, I think you said it beautifully, is that it, it just, 
it adds such a la another layer of depth and dimension to who you are uh, more than just being an athlete ever could. And it's painful, but it's so worth it uh, when you're kind of on that on the tail end or the other side. It, it shows some strength in the vulnerability and not just the strength in the control and resilience that you have as an athlete. I, I sort of see, you know, you coming to terms with two sides of the strength spectrum, I like to call it, you know, and, right. and those are complementary. Right. They're not, they're not opposing. Um, can, can we finish on, on one question uh, relative to your relationship with your, your family and your sisters? Uh, have you guys been able to talk about this moment and sort of share and come to terms together uh, about what happened and how you felt and, and uh, maybe find ways, um, you know, to to give recommendation to others in doing it differently, perhaps? Yes. So I ended up stopping tennis, going back to college. And then my, my sister was really very hurt and angry. You know, in a way she felt abandoned that I had sort of abandoned this dream we had as a family. You know, my father also, like there's so much sacrifice we did. And I, I can understand now that kind of pain that they felt. Yeah. And, uh, then about a year, I think a year later, she ended up also stopping tennis and coming back to school on to the same campus. And that was hard. That was hard for me. I was trying to build my own identity. Uh, I was trying to kind of do my own thing. And then she came back looking for solace and help. And I didn't want anything to do with that. You know, I said, you weren't there for me. I'm doing my own thing. I need my space. And, you know, it wasn't until a couple of years later that we were able to kind of regroup and, and talk about it, you know, and not that it was um, therapeutic, but just that, you know, we didn't, we, we never had a falling out, you know, it was never, it was never like that. We were, we we're always so tight but we had just experienced so much together, good and bad, that we, re I, we, I needed that separation. I really needed that separation so that I could grow, so that I could have those uncomfortable feelings without having a crutch of having a sibling that knew me. Um, and I think she understood that as she went through her journey and then you know how we processed what we did pretty differently, I think, um, kind of was, was a way for us to come back and say, Hey, you know, you're doing okay. You're doing okay. Yeah. You know, but I don't think it's ever been like a, it'll ever be like a sit down and let's, you know, have a cup of coffee about all the things that happened. I don't think we need that. You know, we don't need that as a family. No, you just, you guys just needed the space to grow space. your individuality, um, on your own term. I think it's beautiful. Well, Neha, Thanks for sharing an incredible journey story of up and down. It's amazing. And um, I really appreciate that you were able to be so open and vulnerable about, you know, everything and how you felt. Um, so, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for having me on.